That was a pun. <laughs> so yesterday, Herb talked um, in his beautiful talk on grief and Death Valley. He talked about a movie, The Grass is Greener. And yes, this is that grass. So welcome to Cannabis Consciousness and Culture. And what we're hoping to do today is to look through the lenses of mythology and neuroscience to understand this plant medicine cannabis medically. And then we want to look at getting high, what that's about, because nobody seems to want to talk about that when I can go to the symposium. And as we know that a lot of people are using medical marijuana for that consciousness changing experience. And then last, we're going to look at some of the cultural forces that shaped this medicine in our narrative or our view of it, how it's been an angel and demon in different cultures. And basically, this talk would not be happening except that two years ago, in the state of Oregon, where we live, cannabis became legal. And I can't tell you how that affects the collective consciousness. It's stunning, because neither Yaya or I would have had anything to do with cannabis. But what happened was, clients and patients who I'd been seeing for years began to talk about their marijuana usage. And so I thought, as a psychiatrist, I should find out a little bit more about this medicine. And it's an interesting plant medicine for a conference on creativity and madness, because artists and musicians have used cannabis throughout Western history to stimulate themselves. And it also, for many individuals who are fragile in their ego structures, can push them over into psychosis. Being an organic and biodynamic farmer, suddenly people showed up with cannabis plants for me to plant in our garden that grows most of our vegetables and fruits, as well as many medicinals. So I didn't say no, it's a plant. And I developed a relationship with it. And that's where this also evolves out of. So we're going to start with a myth. This is the myth of the churning of the oceans of milk from the Hindu tradition, and it stars the gods. And the demons. So the gods, you know, who might be the gods? He says with his god mask slightly askew. <laughs> the gods always think they're so great, right? We're up high, we're on Mount Olympus, Moses comes up and sees us with the burning bush on top of the mountain, and maybe we're that part of us way up in our triune brain. Maybe we're that neocortex and that prefrontal cortex and we think we're cool and we're planning and like Steve Jobs, we have beautiful visions and we think about all that stuff and we think we're pretty cool. So that's maybe who the gods are. Ah, but the demons, we are the instinctual nature. We're much closer to the land because we have passion. We want everything to intensity. We don't care if we hate or have anger or bliss. We want it all, even fear. Yeah. So the gods thinking that that's sort of below them and sort of down there somewhere. One day they insult the demons. You really don't care much. I think you're kind of a mess of emotions and instincts and in impulses and poof. And never, demons. never insult a demon because we take the power away. <laughs> so the gods, the thinking brain without the instincts really can't do much. And the gods got weaker and weaker and weaker and they said, hey, we better do something to correct this. Maybe if we met in that emotional brain, that place of relationships in between, we could restore that. So let's do a joint project together. How about that? I don't know. What's in it for me? Well, we can churn the oceans of milk, said the gods. And we could create the elixirs, the amritas of bliss and immortality, thinking that would hook the demons. Ah, sounds kind of yummy. So like in the picture, the gods take the world snake, present the prana, the life energy behind everything, and they start to go back. 
wrapping it around that huge pedestal and they're churning the ocean, uh, breath, which might be our spinal fluid. And as they do that, they say, let's put some stuff in it. Yes. I've got some good stuff here. So they put herbs and spices, maybe all that stuff in our brain. As our brains, as the gods and the demons come into balance, we get a nice gamma wave sweep. Integrating all our different brains. And then all those beautiful neural hormones and neuromodulators when our brains are in balance come. Uh. One of them is cannabis. <gasps> It's all for me. And the demon sees the cannabis, and the gods say, no way, and a titanic battle breaks. <laughs> and the gods rest the cannabis and call it Vijaya for victory. And so we'll be looking as we continue in our presentation. I'll be back. And what the demons are. So we want to look a little bit about the history of cannabis. Cannabis most likely originated in Eastern Asia about 36 million years ago. And through, hu through human-plant interaction and breeding, it has spread all over our precious and fragile Earth. And it's first known in recorded history in about 2700 BC in China, where it's used medicinally. And it spreads from China to India, and it's used medicinally recreationally and spiritually. From there it goes to the Middle East and it gains popularity because although the Quran bans alcohol, it doesn't mention cannabis and so there's a loophole. <laughs> and then it spreads to Europe. And so we probably couldn't find, due to human breeding of cannabis, any of the original plants. But when we look at a cannabis plant, I love these. How many people like these kind of drawings? Please be honest. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, I'll talk to you. There are 489 distinct chemical compounds in the cannabis plant. There are 10 distinct classes and 100 cannabinoids, which are um, a lot of the medicinal qualities, although, as we'll see, the whole plant is medicinal. And this is a map of some of those cannabinoids, and they will mimic the endogenous cannabinoids, the first one being called anandamide, when it was discovered, I think in 1980, for, from the Sanskrit, for bliss. So here are the two top ones, tetrahydrocannabinoid, and that is our THC, and cannabidiol underneath it, that's CBD, and those are the two main ones that we'll be talking about in terms of medicines this morning. And so we ask ourselves, how do these work? and we find that there are receptors, receptors for these plant-based medicines, for these cannabinoids, and there are CB1 receptors, and those are found mainly in our brains and central nervous systems, and there are CB2 receptors, which are found in the immune system and regulate immune functioning and inflammation. And so the THC binds to those CB1 receptors in the brain, and that's what gets people high, and THC CBD and all those other cannabinoids bind to the CB1 and CB2 receptors all throughout, creating the therapeutic and medicinal effects of cannabis. And then we look a little bit at the central nervous system for how this works in our brains. So we see in the spinal cord, it's helping through the spinal cord with pain. In the medulla, there's a chemoreceptor trigger zone, so it can help with nausea and vomiting, especially in chemotherapy patients. And in the basal ganglia and cerebellum, that's where it can affect movement, so we don't want to smoke and drive. <laughs> and then we go to the hypothalamus, and for those of you who remember your college days, that's where you got the munchies from. So it can stimulate appetite, again, helpful in cachectic or wasting diseases. And then we go up to the hippocampus and the amygdala, and it's helpful, uh, it actually can interfere with uh, those do memory functioning, stress, emotions. So it can impact the emotional body and it can interfere with memory, which we will see can be very helpful. And then last but not least, it's at the cerebral cortex and that's where it's altering our perceptions and affecting our brain and the way we perceive reality. So we wanna to go to the CBD and the THC itself. 
So how are they different and what do they do different as we see from this chart? And all the technical stuff is in a handout in your, in your thing, so you don't really need to worry about that. But together they can protect against cancer, they can reduce nausea, relieve pain, they have antidepressant properties, relieving muscle spasms, inflammation, they can protect the central nervous system against degeneration. In our aging brain, studies with CBD finds that they reduce inflammation, plaques and tangles in Alzheimer's disease, in in vitro neural gel matrices. And they can help with infections, having antibacterial and antimicrobial action. But when we look at CBD alone, if you take CBD, it doesn't have that effect of getting you high at all. And that can really be very helpful in seizures. It's a, it is a pretty good anticonvulsant um, for many people. And then it's also helping with anxiety. Where THC will create anxiety, the CBD can treat anxiety. And it actually um, can help also. It has a, a mild antipsychotic effect where THC can push people over into psychoses. The THC by itself does one or two things that are different. It increases appetite, where the CBD does not. Um, and additionally, um, it suppresses, it increases slow wave sleep, so it suppresses dreams. So people who've talked about when they've stopped, all of a sudden their dream life returns. So we're almost through the sort of hardcore part of this uh, presentation, which might be giving Barry PTSD back to that initial creativity and madness in Maui in the darkroom. I don't know how to make this real interesting, but I'm doing my best. So <laughs> here's our CBD, right? And what does it do? CBD actually doesn't bind to either of those receptors. There may be other things it does that we're still uh, learning about, but it actually goes and it lodges in that CB1 receptor and blocks THC from binding. So that's how it can actually protect against the effects. And for those of you who had bad experiences with cannabis when you were younger, if you take a varietal that has CBD and THC, it won't allow that to happen. It'll blunt the anxiety and the paranoia. It binds directly to the opioid receptors. And that's why it's so helpful in pain and getting people off opioid medications. And then it binds to dopamine and serotonin receptors, further impacting mood and our psyches. So. Our, our goal here is just so that you might have intelligent conversations with patients when they report they're using it. Because I think that's what we can do as healthcare providers, because it's not really in that level of prescribing it at this point in time. So first of all, when we're using it more psychiatrically and emotionally, we can use it pretty much at 20 to 1. That's pretty much a pure CBD. And so there's going to be no psychoactivity. It's an anticonvulsant, as I said, an anxiolytic, antipsychotic, and mood stabilizing. So Miss W is about a 30-year-old female in my practice. I've been seeing her for, for about six months to a year. And she was very fragile in her personality structure. We might say a little schizoid or schizotypal. And she revealed to me that she was using cannabis. And I said, well, what, what kind and what's the ratio of CBD to THC? And like most people, they have no idea. Even though at a dispensary now, you can go and they'll give you an elaborate profile of everything that's in it. So I said, with you, I'm concerned. And if you're going to continue to use cannabis, I would prefer that you use a high CBD varietal. A week or two later, she came back two weeks later, and she had switched. And she said she felt much less anxious, more cohesive, was enjoying her life more. So then we move up to the 1 to 1 or 3 to 1 CBD to THC. So they're pretty equal in their ratio. In, use it the dose of about 5 milligrams is what most people start at. It has negligible, if any, psychoactivity. But it helps with pain, muscle spasm, inflammation, and mood disorders or anxiety with depression. Because remember, if you're depressed, we don't want to do anything that would block your endogenous pleasure or mood. THC elevates moods, and so you wouldn't want to block those endogenous cannabinoids that are happening in our brains. So Miss F is about a 50-year-old female in my practice, and she has um, quite a bit of pain at times from um, fibroids and endometriosis. And she's going to go get it checked and worked up on, but she uses at times a two-to-one CBD to THC tincture. So she puts that under her tongue and then she reports in about 15 to 20 minutes, it's like going into a warm bath. All her pain just melts away. And she says it helps her like nothing else that she's tried. 
And we'll look now, as we bring up Yaya, not in her demonic form, why it's important to test for impurities. This is Athena, the second cannabis plant I was given. I named her just like Carol spoke of talking to the music, talking to what was happening when she played the piano. In the same way, I talked to my plants. I developed a kinship with them. See these beautiful little crystalline hairs? They're called trichomes. She's organic and biodynamic, only fed with worm juice. But she has all of her potency is in these trichomes. So you can see that on a cannabis plant, everything is um, concentrated into these little hairs. So I love growing cannabis for its beauty, but there's lots of other reasons why you would grow it. Yes, I want to tell you all about the other reasons. You make a lot of money when you grow cannabis. Yes, and especially if you grow it indoors. Because when you grow it indoors, you can grow it year-round. 90% is grown in greenhouses. Do you know what that means? Let me tell you. That means that when you do that, you have to have all these grow lights on all the time. You also have to have heaters because nobody wants to be cold in winter, especially the plants. So we have, we don't, we have all this wonderful electricity that we use to increase the fossil fuels, to increase climate change. <laughs> We don't care, because we're making money. And let me tell you what else happens in a greenhouse. All the insects love it because they have their own little home. So what do you have to do in a greenhouse? You've got to spray pesticides, herbicides. Do you know that in Colorado, they found out they had to... They had to confiscate thousands upon thousands of edibles and resins and all sorts of our wonderful concoctions we made because it was 30 times over the allowable amount of herbicides and pesticides. Oh, I don't know what they were thinking. It's so good. You know what else happens? Well, when you got that greenhouse... You've got no natural soil happening, so those roots can't go down and get their nutrition. So what do we do? We fill it up with lots of back guano and all these yummy fertilizers. Do you know what that does? Ah, the CO2, carbon, climate change again. Ha, ha, ha. We'll do what we want. <laughs> so this is actually uh, what you can get on any cannabis that you get. This is Athena. This is her chemical constituency. You can see in the pink, there's a lot of CBD, some THC. Um, about, that's about that three to one we've been using for inflammation. You can see a lot above the line in that circle, a lot of the other cannabinoids. And then below the line, you can see all sorts of other chemicals that are in it. We're gonna take a look at that brown chemical there, beta myrcene. So we're gonna go back to our high school and college days, and I don't know how many of you ever suffered from couch lock. <laughs> or saw a friend in couch lock, and they sit in there and they've done their bong hits or whatever, and all of a sudden they're not moving for the rest of the evening. Well, they thought it was the different strains of cannabis, but it's actually that beta myrcene. That terpene is what creates couch lock depending how high or low the plant has that. And when we look at the cannabis plant, there's a bit of a controversy. Do we use a synthetic or do we use the whole plant? And this is from Raphael Mechelum, 
Hospital from Israel, who's one of the, the primary neuroscientists who discovered an andamide in the original receptors. And he says cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids work together in an entourage so that the medical impact of the whole plant is greater than the sum of the individual parts. So we're right here under that cultural difficulty. Do we use things in synthetic ways or do we isolate? Or do we think in both and bring both of those qualities together? And then in any medical talk, it wouldn't be good without looking at the contraindications. So for CBD and THC, if you're pregnant, thinking of becoming pregnant, or breastfeeding, of course you, you don't want to have any ingestion. And then with THC, psychosis, one to five percent of people who use cannabis um, have psychotic episodes, and there's actually an AKT1 genetic variant, and people who have that variant are more susceptible to the mind-altering effects of cannabis, and so we may be able to genetic test, as well as when people have that background history of psychosis or family history, they want to be very, very careful. Um, there's some cardiovascular, so you want to make sure you have a good systolic pressure and that the heart is in good condition. And then with CBD, some of the contraindications are anorexia and depression. Because remember, it's blocking those receptors for THC and our endogenous anandamide. So we wouldn't want to do anything that might decrease our appetite or decrease our, in our natural pleasant mood that would already be depressed in depression with anhedonia especially. Now, what about the common adverse effects? And as you rate this talk, you will find that it says there's supposed to be three adverse effects, and it looks like there are three adverse effects. The first would be anxiety or paranoia. The second is tachycardia. And the third is euphoria, getting high or stoned, which for some people, that is not an adverse effect. <laughs> so we have three or two. You can decide when you rate this talk if I talked about three or two. <laughs> The interesting thing is, in most individuals, most of the time, that can be treated with CBD. You can sort of antidote that um, very quickly and easily. And then just a couple of more warnings. Tolerance, when people take cannabis for pain, after a period of time, they will receptor up and down regulate, and it doesn't work as well. They need to use more and more. If they take a holiday for a week or two, which is an agonized experiencing for those people, their receptors will reset, and then they can start again at a lower dose. I think most of us in clinical practice, this is part of the shadow, and everything has shadow and light. This is the part of the shadow, is that amotivational syndrome. And I know lots of us have seen in our practice people who are stagnant, who are stuck in their lives, and that goes right along with that addiction rate of about 9%. And especially we want to be sensitive and careful for the 16 to 24-year-old male population, because when they come looking for medical cannabis, they pretty much want to get high. They're at high risk to become addicted and neurodevelopmentally, while in the adult brain, there are, we can see there are a lot of beneficial effects. There are not many det detrimental effects. But in the developing <clears throat> brain, which, as we know, in about the mid-20s, the hardware in our brain has finished maturing the software for the rest of our lives. And even with all the neuroplasticity, a lot's laid down. So in the developing brain, it's not a good idea to use. So we would have to reverse the normal sequence. In the American family, junior should not be using cannabis, and mom and dad should. <laughs> and then lastly, over there, we talk about bronchial irritation. It does when smoked, it irritates. So when people are doing their delivery, really the most sophisticated way that most people use now is they use these vape pens that you have for tobacco. And the nice thing about that form of delivery is a patient can take an inhalation, and within two to five minutes, they know if that's the right dose or not. So the biofeedback in our individual systems is very powerful. Tinctures is the next um, form, and it's usually an alcohol-based tincture. It can go right on the tongue. It can go in sublingually, usually in about 15 to 20 minutes, as in the case I said, of that patient of mine. It'll take effect, so you can, again, titrate pretty easily. And then inhalation, because of you know bronchial irritation, cancer risk, is not a preferred form of delivery. And edibles are very tricky, and that's where people in the state of Colorado got into trouble when it was first legalized. They'd eat something, 15 to 20 minutes, nothing was happening. They'd eat more, another 15 to 20 minutes, nothing's happening. They eat more, and then it starts to come on. And then they get into that anxious, paranoid state. They're, they're overwhelmed. So that's why edibles are, are very tricky to use. 
So we want to move from some of the medical to looking and talking about consciousness and getting high, because maybe the goal is expansion of consciousness. And we'll start with a poem by Rumi. Rumi, from the 1200s, loved to use the symbol of wine as a way of expanding consciousness to be able to unite with the beloved or one's muse, however you want to call it. And so that's what he does in this poem. God, you know that mystery. Creator, God has given us why so potent that those who become intoxicated with it escape from the two worlds. Oh, I don't have to hear how I'm not good enough, how I haven't done enough, how there's always something or a different way from you or from me. Escape. She has put into the form of hashish a power that delivers us from self-consciousness. I can do whatever I want if I'm not worried about you. She has made sleep so that erases every thought. God has created thousands upon thousands of wines cannabis, entheogens, you name it, that take over our minds. But don't be deceived by every kind of wine. Jesus, you know that guy who was into love? He was intoxicated with God. His donkey? Hey ha, hey ha, with barley. like the demons. Seek, seek, seek the wine of joy, of joy. Which is found in the blessed ones where it's stored. Every object of love is like a jar. One full with dregs like the bottom of the wine barrel. Another full of pure pearls. Every kind of wine, every kind of substance that alters us, it gets us high, high. But be a connoisseur and taste with caution. Judge 
like a queen. A queen who's connected with herself and the land. Judge like a queen and choose the one not tainted with fear. I'm afraid of being in this world. I'm afraid of the climate change. How it keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter. I'm afraid of how few people want to farm anymore. They're all into their devices. Choose the one not tainted with fear and vain expectations. I'll do it. I'll change the world. I'll go to a rally. Surely that'll do it. Judge like a queen, like a king. Any why will get you Thank you. So changing consciousness with all those different whys is actually an integral part of the human experience. We are actually consciousness changing, homo consciousness changing us, probably should be our, 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 our name. Do that as children, we spin and we spin and we hyperventilate and we collapse and laugh on the lawn. And then we go to movies, we like to be scared or a love story. We eat all sorts of foods and malaise and spicy foods, and we go to cooking classes in Santa Fe, and we come to conferences like this to stimulate our minds and to change our consciousness. And we sit there with our clients and patients, and we try to help them expand and change their consciousness. And we go to amusement parks and go on those rides, and we do extreme sports, and we can take alcohol and cannabis and all sorts of other plant-based medicines to shift and change our consciousness. And that perhaps is what some of the recreational use is about. People are scared and tired and fragmented and overwhelmed. And they want to feel good, get high, and they want novelty. They want to erase and relax and get out of the stuck routines of their lives. It's like Carl Jung said, modern man in search of a soul, we want something more and different. And cannabis is actually considered to be a feminine plant. And if there are no males, a cannabis plant will grow a male plant to fertilize itself, and then the male will die off. So some people think this kind, when it changes our consciousness this way, that it's affecting some of that patriarchal consciousness which is strangling and destroying our world. But people also talk about spiritual use. So as I read through this list, and these are lists of common factors of spiritual or mystical experience, I want you to think back either to patience or personal experience with cannabis. Which one of these do you think cannabis opens for you? Unity, a sense of everything interconnected and part of one whole. Transcendence of time and space. Time goes away and you're in the infinite and the eternal. A positive mood develops, sometimes with weeping. A sense of sacredness, of awe, of wonder. A noetic quality where there's a direct knowing or perception of reality that gives illumination and insight far beyond our conceptual brains. And ineffability, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. It's beyond our words. So how might this all come about? We go back to what Carol said yesterday, that our friend the default mode network. So this is that, those series of centers in the brain that link up and form our resting baseline identity. The story of you that you take to be real is actually, I think of as a resonant energetic pattern being generated from the default mode network in each of our brains. So what do we know about the interaction between cannabis and the default mode network? THC depresses the default mode network. As your default mode network is depressed, you begin to forget your sense of self begins to relax and dissolve. And when it's suppressed a certain amount, um, 
collateral thinking happens in your brain. You're no longer locked into this narrow groove, so inside illumination, new thoughts can develop. So how does that then relate to spiritual and spiritual use? We heard about Isaac Newton. So there are two main fields in modern physics. There's classical or Newtonian physics, and there's quantum physics and quantum field theory. Newtonian physics is the way we perceive reality from a classical perspective. It's called macro states of consciousness. And in that, we are separate, unique individual entities, and time flows in a linear fashion. On a quantum level, and that's how the universe really exists, very small particles moving very fast, going in and out of being waves that are connected to the whole. On a quantum level, time can flow forwards or backwards. And if you remember that quote by Steve Jobs, connecting the dots forward and backwards, Time can flow forwards and backwards. Sometimes in dreams, they're out of sequence. And on a quantum level, everything's entangled. Everything's interrelated. Everything's interconnected. And when I go to the, consciousness, the, the symposiums on consciousness and modern physics, there are real problems if the universe is made of matter. And what some of the physicists say is, in fact, if the universe is made of consciousness, all the problems that they're faced of in quantum theory and quantum field theory disappear. And that would mean the universe is a vast field of conscious awareness, and each of us are a localized field of awareness. The localized field of awareness is being maintained by the default mode network. When your default mode network is suppressed, you open what the mystics say, you go past the mind mesh, and you can open to a direct noetic knowing perception of the quantum nature of reality. And that's inherent in each one of us as a human being, to have that direct perception of the consciousness. And that's so important in our day and age, because it brings back the sense of interdependency, interconnection. And as the Christian mystic Telhard de Chardin said, the 21st century will be spiritual or not at all. And we want to go back to the quality of forgetting that we can block the hippocampus, we can depress the default mode network. This is a lithiograph from Greek mythology, and it said, when the soul dies, they sip or they're bathed in the river Lethe, which causes them to forget their life. So why should forgetting be so central and important? Don't we all want to remember everything? If we didn't forget, we would be flooded with information and memories, and we would be psychotic and couldn't function. So when we forget, we forget our pains, we forget our routines, we forget our conceptual thinking, we forget our regrets of the past and our worries of the future. We forget time, we step out of the tyranny of time, and we're in that sense, that flow state that we talked about yesterday. We're in that sensory experience of reality, we're numinous, we're in the here and now, and like this figure, a walk on the beach becomes a walk on the beach and we enter that sense of wonder and flow. And this is really important, especially when we consider the medical research on cannabis in post-traumatic stress disorder. Because in post-traumatic stress disorder, the memories of those traumas are being replayed over and over and crashing in on everyday life, along with the hyperarousal. So when cannabis is imbibed by someone with PTSD, it can interrupt the remembrance in the hippocampus shut down the default mode network, and that barrage of memories slows and stops, and there's relief, as well as calming the hyperarousal. So now we're going to switch to look a little bit at cultural aspects of cannabis. I thought it would be interesting to get a feel for how the views of cannabis have changed over time. So... Cannabis was brought over to North America by the Spaniards because they were used the hemp in the rope in the ships. So when they brought it over to the U.S. as more cultivated hemp plants, which are low in THC and is using more of the whole fiber of the plant rather than just those trichomes that I showed you on the buds, this became a huge part of what was integrated into America. It was, it, it composed 75 to 90% of the fibers they used. 
George Washington, Thomas Jefferson grew hemp on their land. And as a matter of fact, the Declaration of Independence, the first draft was printed and signed on hemp. So we have a long history of this plant being with us here. So it begins to um, change as cotton comes in. It actually frees up the plant to be looked at as more a medicinal use. So many of the drug companies began to research, and as you can see, they integrated it into their pharmacopoeia and used it for, I think it's over 100 different kind of illnesses at that time. And those were famous ones like Eli Lilly and Bristol Myers Squid. None of us, we weren't even really aware of that until we began to research this article. It was actually an important part of American culture and a major medicine. So what happens, like in this tarot card of the crucifixion, what happens when we have that shift in a collective narrative, a story about a plant or a plant-based medicine? We begin to encounter some of those pesky demons again. So we're going to move through time now from the... Um, late 1800s when hemp was so popular to now we're going into the 1930s. Ah, yes, I'm back. You know, I'm always going to be around. You can't get rid of me. But this time, I am in the form of Harry Anslinger. I know I don't exactly look like him, but you can imagine the more balding head and a little bit more stout, and I am the first director of the recently created Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Yes. And I am really attuned to all these things that are going on in the world that are not so good, things that are out of the box, particularly jazz music. Yes, I'm not kidding. Don't you laugh about that. It's no laughing matter. Do you know what happens? I'll tell you, those entertainers, and they're all Negroes. I'm a racist, but I'm gonna, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get me to say that. I'm going to just tell you it through the way that I put down cannabis. So these Negroes, they come and they smoke, and then they write this crazy music, and then they give it to women. This stuff, the reefer, devil's lettuce, and then their satanic music and the devil's lettuce, and the women, they all get together. Oh, it's terrible. We've got to do something about it. So this is what I decide to do. I'm testifying before Congress, and this is what I say. Marijuana is the most violence-causing drug in the history of mankind. Most marijuana smokers are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Ah! They're satanic music jazz and swing result from marijuana usage. Reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. The primary reason to outlaw marijuana is its effect on the degenerate races. Yes, racism married the war against cannabis. And not only that, but we knew who's bringing it here. Those Hispanics. Yes. Now, I'm going forward. I've got another little balding head, you know, at least in the front here. And now we've come into the 1960s, where, you know, there's a little bit more cannabis usage with the hippies. 
and the anti-war movement, and I'm John Ehrlichman. And I've been appointed by Richard Nixon as the d domestic policy chief. And I'm here to really support Nixon. There's all these different factions out there that are causing trouble, the Black Panthers, the anti-war people. And so I'm going to put a stop to that again. And I know how to marry the problem with drugs and cannabis to getting rid of the problems we don't want around. This is what I have to say. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies. Read my lips, two enemies. The anti-war left and the black people. <sighs> you understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or against the blacks, but by getting the public, <laughs> yeah, it's that propaganda stuff, by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt their communities. We could arrest their leaders, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did you know? Did we know? We were lying about the drugs? <laughs> yes, of course we did. Yes, of course we did. The demons. <laughs> kind of nice when you get to perform with your muse. <laughs> So many of you know the scary man in the left-hand corner, our current Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, and I think he looks a lot like a combination with his racism of Anslinger and Ehrlichman. He's sort of, there, you know, all these sort of white guys combined there. So if I was going to talk, um, we're going to continue, the war on drugs continues up to this very day. And so what happens? America jails more of its citizens than any other country in history, and one out of three of those imprisonments is for drugs, and 50% of those are for marijuana. Black Americans are arrested eight times more frequently than white Americans, but their drug usage is roughly the same. And many of our hard-earned civil liberties have been given up in the fight against drugs of which cannabis is, was, the poster child. So if I was going to have a few words with Jeff Sessions, I would let him know that cannabis has been legalized in 28 states. I also, as I was preparing this talk, I didn't know if he'd still be Attorney General. So when I was going to have to see if I could find his slide with the new Attorney General or not. I mean, he might not even, he might have been taken out this morning. Who knows? But if he's still there, I'd say it's in 28 states, and you know why it's becoming legalized now, sadly? Because more and more mainstream Americans, more and more white Americans are using it. So we'd have to target everybody, not just the minority groups that he wants to target. So what are the facts that debunk the fake news? First of all, in states that have legalized medical cannabis, physicians write far fewer prescriptions for opioids. Opioid deaths are down to 25% in states that have legalized cannabis. So if you're serious about the war on drugs, we'd legalize medical cannabis immediately. Then when we look at the long-term health damage to studies, it's not significant. And in fact, we see there can be a lot of beneficial use in the right people in the right time. And it's far less than tobacco and alcohol and opioids. What about addiction, legitimate concern, 9%, far less than tobacco, opioids, and alcohol, once again. 
And then when we look, is this a gateway drug? Studies have long debunked that theory. It just ain't so. And then last but not least, my slide is doing something funny here. Is marijuana, Mr. Sessions, an incitement to violent crime? No. In fact, several studies have shown that cannabis inhibits aggression. So I hope you heard that. <laughs> and what are those horrible Hispanics that Mr. Anslinger wanted to vilify? What did they do? June 19th, 2017, the nation of Mexico legalizes medical marijuana. And some people think that they're just trying to say this to the United States for the war on drugs. <clears throat> so as we're coming to sort of wrap things up a little bit, what does the legalization of cannabis, aside from that I could take it and affect my conscience personally and individually, what does it mean in terms of us collectively? I believe the legalization of cannabis represents the legalization of our human need and desire to change consciousness and to connect with a life of imminence and wonder in the here and now, however we choose to do that. Because in fascist totalitarian states, they want to control our consciousness, not allow us the freedom of thinking for ourselves. And this is this year's plant that someone gave to us, Aphrodite. <laughs> I'll say one more thing about legalization. Actually, on one level, it's not a big deal. The people who think the world is going to fall apart if you're in a state where it's legalized, it's not a big deal. It doesn't fall apart. The people who think the world will be saved, the world is not saved. You have more tax revenues and you have more control over quality of what you're getting. And it's, there's a legitimacy. There's a legality. Things aren't in the shadows anymore. The suppression of consciousness is not in the shadows anymore. So one of the problems with our use of herbal plant-based medicines is we, we don't have a culture that does wide use. We can't use anything in a sacred way anymore. So this is Shiva from the Hindu tradition where we started. Shiva is the deity associated with cannabis use in ancient India. And if you know the mythology of Shiva, Shiva drinks the poison and turns it into nectar, transforms the poison externally and internally in each of us. And so whenever we use a plant-based medicine, if you choose at some point to use cannabis, use it wisely. Think about your CBD to THC ratio, but use it sacredly. The intention with any psychoactive substance is incredibly important. It affects things on a quantum level. So the intention is essential. The set, the setting. So if you're going to use it recreational, say, I want to use this this afternoon to forget my troubles and worries and have a break from my chaotic life. So we'll end with the transformation of addiction, another poem by Jalaluddin Rumi. This is how a human being can change. There's a worm addicted to eating grape leaves, but it could be addicted to thinking we're a bad person inside, could be addicted to heroin, all sorts, you name it. But that worm is addicted. Mm, you know what it's like when you can't think about anything but your coffee or whatever else, your lover. Mm, suddenly, the worm wakes up. Call it Grace psychotherapy, who knows, whatever, the worm wakes up. Suddenly she 
is the whole vineyard. And the orchard too. Every part of this entire room. Each person, the fruit tree, the trunk, our legs. A growing wisdom and joy. This is fun. It's fun being a human. And the worm is no longer a worm. This is consciousness. May we all join into it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I wanted to say that if you want to come and play with us on our land and you're a burned out health professional, don't forget about embodied ecology. It's quite fun, and you don't even have to use cannabis. <laughs> well.